Hey, everybody. Welcome to Perpetual Motion, a podcast focused on culture, communication, wellness, and relationships. I'm the host, Dr. Mo Anderson. I'm a best-selling author and speaker whose goal is to help you stress less, produce more, and love the ones you're with. This episode, my guest is Sam Thiara, a storyteller, writer, educator, TEDx speaker, and entrepreneur. He is a lecturer at the Beatty School of Business at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. This episode, we're discussing cultural identity, leadership, and overcoming obstacles. You can't say Dr. Mo ain't tell you You that fear magnifies the consequences of failure. What are you scared of? Why are you afraid? I'd rather live like I'm dying than live to die any day. My heart is pure. My Welcome is to Perpetual Motion with Dr. Mo Anderson Sam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be able to share stories and insights and hopefully provide some insights to your listeners. I know you will. I know you will. So you took a journey to India to find your ancestral roots. You were a foreigner, but not a foreigner. Tell us about that transformational trip. It was a journey that I took because, you know, I was born in England, raised in Canada. My parents are from Fiji. Grandparents are from India. And I always struggled with this aspect of identity, cultural identity, because you know, visibly, if you were to see me, people think I'm from India. And uh, as a result, they look at you and they say, what part of India are you from? You're like, well, I was born in England, raised in Canada. Then they're like, no, no, your parents, what part of India? Mm -hmm. And then you're like, well, they're from Fiji Islands. And then they scratch their head going, but are you Indian? Well, my grandparents are from India. And as a result of this, as I struggled with this cultural identity, I felt like you know, growing up in, in Canada, in Vancouver, you know, you grow up in a place where, you know, you're Canadian. I mean, we play hockey, we eat hot dogs, you scrape your knee, you bleed maple syrup. That's about as Canadian as I could be. And I remember in, in primary school and high school, you see yourself as Canadian until somebody beats you up one day because you don't look like them or you're not what they seem as Canadian. Right. But what I found is when I got to university, it was a much more global audience. And I started to think about, you know, meeting people from other parts of the world and then saying, OK, what am I missing? Because now I'm meeting people from India, from Pakistan and South Asia, and they're sharing their culture with me. And I felt it was missing. So I decided to go to India to try to find that cultural identity to spark something. And it was interesting because it was the fact that going to India, I felt like a foreigner going to a land that shouldn't be foreign to me. There were some tones and, you know, aspects that I, I would say that, you know, made me feel a bit comfortable in that place. But it was also that I felt foreign to this place. Hmm. And it was a need to realize and capture that part of that cultural identity. And that became this beautiful journey to, to India for the very first time. And, you know, the, the thing about India that I found really fascinating is such a discrepancy from, you know, this opulence and these magnificent structures to the poverty or injustices that you see. And, you know, it's it was really difficult for someone like me because I do a lot of community activation, supporting community organizations. But the poverty there is at such a, a significant level, there's nothing you can do except observe. And that, I think, was really difficult for me as a realization when I went to India. There were many things that I gained as a result of this trip. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because I went with my mind my eyes and my heart open to this experience. That's beautiful. So you, I mean, you go to journey, you go to India to find your ancestral mm -hmm. roots. And I, and I can imagine there would be things that are familiar, you, you know, food, a cadence, a way of moving that you had seen in your, your parents and, and other relatives. But 
what I found most interesting about your journey is that you just had a photo Mm -hmm. and somehow connected that to finding relatives. Share that, share that part of the journey, if you will. Yeah, because part of the trip to India was, yeah, as you mentioned, searching for my ancestral roots. I mean, my grandfather left India when he was maybe 17 years old, 1905. He was on his way to, as we understand, Argentina. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the boat stops in Fiji. And we don't know one of three stories. I mean, that's that's the challenge when you when you have such a time frame that people haven't asked well, did he land in Fiji because and and stay there because he figured he had a, you know, coming from a landlocked country, you know, I had enough of sea life. Maybe, you know, he saw what paradise Fiji was and said, this is where I need to be. Mm-hmm. Or maybe maybe he thought this was Argentina, got off the boat, the ship left, <laughs> and he's like, what wait, this isn't Argentina. I mean, but then that's where life started for my grandfather. And that's where my, my father was born, married my mom, we moved to England. Mm-hmm. But the the challenge was that, you know, people got busy with their lives and never really found the connection back to India. And, you know, instead, they were looking forward, but never looking back to where the ancestors came from. Mm-hmm. So my grandfather, you know, he would tell my my father that the name of the village it sits in a town about six miles away, and the district is this. And really, that's all that uh, anybody knew about this village. So one person who actually had gone to the village many, many years ago was my dad's older brother. But before he passed away, nobody really asked about the details of this village. So again, we didn't have the, the details, but all I had was this faded photograph that's about three and a half inches by three and a half inches, and it's dingy and faded with a bunch of people standing in front of a house. So the journey to India was about finding my identity, but it was also recovering or finding this this history of ours. And it really was a very fine, fine thread that was holding us back or keeping us connected to this ancestral route. So the journey was an interesting one because India is a big country. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm a foreigner going to a land that shouldn't be foreign to me, searching for a needle in a haystack and not knowing where this haystack exactly was. Wow, what courage that took. My goodness, (laughs) I'm impressed. Well, but it was equally that there was also a lot of noise. People who said, you can't find it, you won't find it, you won't get a good reception. And I think I went with, guarded optimism. So went off to India. And, you know, I wanted to discover the country. But I also wanted to find this village. And uh, the interesting thing was a day before I left for India, my step cousin in Fiji had contacted me and he said, Oh, I heard you're looking for your village. And the name of the village is this and you know, it was different than what we had, it was sounded similar, but it was different. Hmm. So I thought, okay, and and I found something similar to the name he gave me. He said, I've made it to the town, but I didn't find the village, but here's what the name of the village is. So I found something similar to it, and it sat about five, six miles away from the town. And I thought, this must be it. I asked my father, and he said, yeah, I think this is it. Well, here's somebody who shows up at a house with this faded photograph in a courtyard, and these people are just having their afternoon cup of tea. And they, I, you know, we walk up, my driver, myself, and my wife, and we basically say, you wouldn't happen to be our family, would you? And, <laughs> oh, my. Wow. Well, and then the beauty of all of this is people want to help. Yes, they do. And, you know, then people are looking at this photograph. People are saying, well, I mean, there's somebody in the picture, and they look like this person, and or I think they're so-and-so, and, you know, Two people get into our vehicle, we drive to a house and people come out, look at the photo and they're like, no, this isn't the right house. Mm. But then there's some optimism because they say, but it looks like this one. And then we drive to this part or somebody said it's in the old part of town or the village. And then we go there. And again, it was guarded optimism. But the more houses we went to, slowly the journey started to dissipate and evaporate before my eyes. 
And I remember writing in my journal that it was a, it was beautiful people, but it wasn't the right village. And here's one thing that really was beautiful, though. When we circled back to the original house where we left from, right? the people said, you know, it's okay. Come back tomorrow and be part of our family. Oh, wow. So I had that. And it was it was so gracious of them, but I really felt I didn't want to give up at this point. Okay. The next day, I decided to just go to the town that we were told, and let's just talk to people. And I remember, same thing. People said, "Why are you looking? You won't find it. No, never heard of it." And this one person said, "Oh, I think the village you're looking for is this, and it's up six miles up the road this way." Again, guarded optimism. And I'm like, you know what? I've had these setbacks. I don't know. Anyways, next thing you know, we're driving and there's this five, six miles we pass. And then there's this archway. And at the archway is this old man just seated there. He's about 80 years old, no glasses, just sitting there staring at the ground. We stop and we say, is this the name of this village, which is what I knew it to be? And he said, yes. So we showed him the photograph and he looked at the picture and no glasses, old gentleman. He said, well, I don't know about the house, but there's a gentleman in the back. He looks like so-and-so. I look at the picture and I can't even make out that person. And I'm like, okay, here we go again. He gets into our vehicle. We drive to a house. He walks up to it with the photograph. People come out of the house. And when they are out of the house, they start looking at the photograph And, you know, there's this one woman in the photograph with a white shawl. And all of a sudden, this woman, I hear her. She goes, that's me in the picture. Who are you? Wow. Excuse me. Did I hear this correctly? She goes, yeah, that's me. Who are you? How amazing is that? And it was one of those, as soon as we realized, all of a sudden, the tears flowed. We hugged each other. And just this aspect, and I remember her words to me were, you're home. And all of a sudden, this identity, uh, this cultural piece, this connectedness to this place, just everything just came together because I found it. And it was that important to me to do this, that uh, I traveled to India with actually Ziploc bags in my pocket, Mm -hmm. because in the hopes that I could find this village. Well, let me just jump sure. in here before you tell that part of, yeah. of the story. Just for reference, yeah. we all know India is yeah. a large place, dense, densely populated. I just Googled it just to ensure that I said yeah. the right figure. There are 1.38 billion people in India as of 20, as of the 2020 census. Yeah. And that you went there, not quite sure the town with no names. Yeah. And that kudos to the people of India who were that welcoming to you, because I don't want to name any major metropolitan (laughs) cities here. But even if you came up to my house with a photo, asking if it looked familiar, I'd have to talk to you through ring. You know, (laughs) be like, get out of here. I don't know you. I can't help you. Yeah. that that just says a lot about you, I think, as well, and the energy that you and your wife were giving mm-hmm. off and that you were genuinely wanting connectedness because mm-hmm. sometimes people do not want yeah. that. They have ulterior motives. So I, I think people could sense that, but that you actually accomplished your mission, that needle yeah. in a haystack, as you said, is truly remarkable. And, and the guarded optimism, I've never heard that phrase before but Mm -hmm. I like that I would just call it faith Mm -hmm. but the you know belief in things unseen that something good is going to come of this and it sounds like you were prepared for the outcome whatever it might be but hopeful yes if you find a family member and you did I'm so happy for you what a great great story so you had some baggies (laughs) no so Ziploc bags with me and uh, the whole idea behind it with this guarded optimism is If I should find my grandfather's house, I want to go out to the fields, I want to scoop up dirt, and I want to bring that home to my family in Canada, so that they've never been to India, but they've got something from this place. And the people that I met that were at this house were my grandfather's older brother's family. 
So mm-hmm. that's how close okay. the relationship is. Yeah. Wow. wow. That's right on the family tree. Mm-hmm. That's that's quite a remarkable story. And I think will inspire a lot of people to go from Ancestry.com and 23 to, and me to actually yeah. take those trips and go back to the towns and, and villages and, and cities and find mm-hmm. true connectedness with, with real human beings. That's, that's an amazing story. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned the word, we've said the word several times, connectedness, and I think it's easy to know what that means, but you have a, a puzzle analogy around that idea. Tell me about that. Yeah, years ago, I started doing this. I had an event, and I had people coming to this event, and I was thinking to myself, you know, these are important people in my life, and I wanted to do something that just said, you are my community, you are important to me. So I wound up giving every single person a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And it's one piece, but everybody got one. And it was so funny because here we are in a pub. And as I walked around the room, I saw people, the puzzle piece was next to their glass or just sitting on a table. And I got up and I said, each of you received a jigsaw puzzle piece when you arrived. There's a reason. I want to share with you that the single piece, not much you can do with it. It's just one piece, and I've given it to you. What can you do with one piece? And people were like, not much. It's one piece. I said, it's ordinary, but I want to make it extraordinary. And they were like, okay. And all of a sudden, I saw people starting to grab those little pieces, and they were holding them. I said, this is what you feel like. You feel like that single piece of a jigsaw puzzle. You don't know where you fit in. Mm -hmm. You don't know what the bigger picture is. I want to make it extraordinary because then I pulled out a satchel and I've got a satchel in my hand with puzzle pieces. And I told them, I said, if I give you this single piece of a jigsaw puzzle, do you realize my puzzle is permanently incomplete without you? Do you realize how important you are to me? And all of a sudden, the puzzle pieces went into their palms. And then next thing you know, it wound up in their wallets and their purses. And I did this years ago. Mm -hmm. I've given about 5,000 pieces in the world to date. At the end of my last lecture, I use this. When I meet people at an event, we talk, and then I share this with them. What's amazing about this is I can actually physically see a transformation on their face because they suddenly realize you've shifted something from what's obvious Mm -hmm. to something that's purposeful and meaningful. I've had people tell me that it's taped to their mirror. Every morning they wake up, it reminds them someone said that they mattered. It's traveled in backpacks around the world. It's in little curio boxes. It's in wallets. And I've seen pictures of people who have shown pictures saying, here's my wallet, here's the piece. And I've also had people who have said they're going through very difficult times in their life. And it was very dark. And they saw the puzzle piece and they held on to it. And it wasn't that that got them out of the darkness, Mm -hmm. but they said it reminded me that I was connected to you. And that was one thing that helped. So anytime I meet somebody, I always like to give them a piece of a jigsaw puzzle to remind them how important they are to me and that they matter. And I need them in order to make myself complete. But it also means they're connected to such a large community right now. And people they may not even know, but they're connected to so many other people who hold a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. That's the analogy. That's a wonderful analogy. I have not heard it. It really resonates with me as someone who is also a people person. And and it's very important to me Mm -hmm. that, you know, my relationships be strong. And as you said that also, Sam, what came to mind was uh, my family. Mm -hmm. Uh, When my boys were young, working for weeks, we would put puzzles on the formal dining room table that no one uses. So it became the puzzle place. And I remember one in particular we put together of several hundred pieces. And as beautiful as it was, there was one piece missing, you know, and how very disappointed we were. It was not complete, even though it had hundreds of other pieces. We needed that one piece. And and to think of ourselves like that in in that that's, you know, how much we matter for, you know, completeness as you look down from the heavens is just, oh, I love the image that you've 
given us. And please keep doing that. That is that is quite a remarkable thing. And I, I, I would hang on to my piece as well. I have to send you a puzzle piece. By all means, please do. Just to remind me, because you can feel so very small and like you don't fit anywhere, mm-hmm. but, but you're part of a, a big, important puzzle. Mm-hmm. Very, very good. I love that. I, that's where the, the the professor, the teacher and you, the lecturer, Ted Talker, just came, really came together. You, you told that so well. You're, I, I mentioned in the intro that you're an educator, a speaker, you've done a couple of TEDx talks. And so it's clear that you believe in leadership and that one of the things I read that you said is that leadership is not a place to be or a position, but rather a lifestyle. And moreover, we don't determine if we are a leader, but the people around us do. Now that that is not a very American thing, <laughs> although I agree wholeheartedly with it. Would you explain that a bit? There are times where people will come to me saying, I want to be a leader. What do I need to do? And as we have these conversations, I always like to ask questions. I don't like to respond with advice. And I said, oh, so you came to me. And they said, yeah, because you're a leader. I said, oh, what makes me a leader? And they use these beautiful words. And I look at them and I said, there's only one thing and only one thing that makes me a leader. Would you like to know what it is? And they lean forward because I'm just about to give them the answer. And I said, it's followers. I don't determine if I'm a leader. The followers determine if I'm worthy of that title. And they're like, oh, how do I get more followers? (laughs) Social media. (laughs) I don't think you get this. But but that's true. But the idea, though, is, and what it, it helps me to realize is that leadership is not a place, position, or a title. When you have that title, It doesn't mean you are doing things that are worthy of that title of leadership. Instead, I said, the people around you determine if you've earned, if you're worthy of that title. So there are people who might see me as a leader. I'm sure there are people that don't see me as a leader for any number of reasons. But I think we spend so much time focusing on leadership. I also want to focus on this term followership Mm -hmm. because majority of the people are followers. And I'm not talking about the yes people. I'm not talking about the people that blindly follow. And that's where people think that's what a follower is. No, a a follower is this beautiful person who challenges the leader, encourages the leader, is there to say, let's work on this together. Let's support. They may be a leader in some respects as well. But I think we need to spend more time also cultivating this aspect of followership. So for me, leadership is this aspect of, you know, do what's right, roll up your sleeves. And that's why one of the things that make up my foundation is I call myself a servant leader. It doesn't matter who gets the title. I I don't care who gets the credit for it. Uh, It doesn't matter. It's not about status. If there's a need, I will roll up my sleeves and I'll be there to support and get things done. So leadership is, as mentioned, not a place or position or title. Leadership is a lifestyle. Be the best you can be. And the people around you determine if you're worthy of that title. And that's how I would describe it. That's that's very, very good. And and people, you know, the there's so many types, ways you can become a leader. And positional is typically the way we think of as a leader because you have you know, a title because you have the corner office, those types of things. But I think many of us have been in situations where we know that person with the title is not the, is not the leader. It may even be the head of household title and they're not the leader, you know, Uh, but that it's more the relationships and who people have confidence in and trust in. And a lot of that comes from what you do and right. not what you say and not the letters before or after your name. And yeah. that is a, a very good le- lesson for current, future, previous leaders as to how you take that role mm-hmm. when you're, you know, assigned it, when you're giving it, given it, that it, it it's a blessing 
to have it and that you can easily lose it when you forget why you're there and who you're there for. No, and one of the interesting things, because I did my master's in leadership at a university in England, and I had an Mm -hmm. epiphany because it dawned on me that leadership is a Western construct. Because in Hindi, which is the language they speak in India, Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure out what's the word for leadership in Hindi. And there is no word. It doesn't mean they don't have it. It's just that, you know, people may use the word of a title. But again, then they're like, yeah, but that's a title. That doesn't mean they're a leader. Right. We know what leadership is, but it's interesting how in India, there isn't a word for leadership, but yet they have, they do it, but there's just not a word. And I thought that was fascinating that it's a a construct that we've created in the West that still applies in the Eastern world. And I'm sure that other languages may have it, Mm -hmm. but it was just fascinating that there isn't a word for it in this language. Hmm. Good to know. I did. I didn't know that. And I don't doubt at all that it's a construct, <laughs> not at all, just because I, I, I've lived long enough to see <laughs> all the different ways that just having that title doesn't mean yeah. you have the gift of yeah. leadership. So you are, in addition to being, I would say, a, a leader, I would, I would uh, ascribe that to you, even if you don't, and we mean it in the positive sense of the word because of of what you're doing, not necessarily uh, your position. But in addition to that, you're also a mentor, a very active mentor. I think you told me you mentor three to eight people a week. And that's been a lot of conversations to date, thousands. Mm -hmm. What have you learned? I'm, I'm sure your mentees have learned a lot and gained a lot from association and conversations with you, but what have you learned mm-hmm. from those conversations? And, and I, I love the way you frame that because oftentimes it's one directional. It's uh, People think of mentorship as this unilateral, I'm going to give you this insight, I'm going to give you this gift. And oftentimes they miss the bigger picture of, but what do I, what am I gaining as a result of this? So I I appreciate the way that you've described that. What I've gained out of this conversation, uh, these conversations with, with this audience of 15 to 40 year olds now is a real understanding and appreciation for what they're capable of doing and what they bring to the forefront. They are, and I, and I think sometimes you know, baby boomers or Gen Xs label millennials, you know, in a particular way that they are this, they are that. Right. Whereas in the environment that I sit and watching them, I'm I'm like, I think what you really uh, need to understand is how they can contribute to society. What I've learned is that, you know, they, they want to have a meaningful place they uh, in this world of contributing to the society. And you know, they're, they're focused on collaboration. Uh, I know that, and this is a generalization, not 100% of them are focused on, you know, collaboration. Some, yeah, they're, they're cutthroat, or they uh, focus on looking at me only. But what I realize is, you know, what I and what I've gained is their tremendous spirit. And the way that they've interacted and engaged in the collaboration space and piece that I think may be lacking and, you know, that, you know, they're hungry for wanting to make a difference in this world, you know, and that's what I've gained. And it's also a a way that I can say that I've, I've become a wiser person as a result of the interactions with these individuals and you know they're they share with me and one thing that i i will use is a word that is in my language the word is pyar p y a a r the word pyar means love but there's many different versions of love we can talk about but the pyar that i'm talking about is this genuineness that comes deep within an individual of appreciation and gratitude and this is what i've seen so often, just prior to this podcast, I just finished uh, uh, closing off one of my lectures, uh, like classes, it's done. And the student reached out to just say, thank you for one of the best semesters I've ever had. Oh. And the fact that she said, 
and I look forward to interacting and engaging. I want to learn from you, but my response back was, but I also want to learn from you as well. And uh, I look forward to having that conversation with that student. And this happens oftentimes, but I think the idea is we need to always remember that it's not a unilateral interaction. We gain as a result of the time we spend with these individuals. Absolutely. Not at all. And, and I agree with you uh, completely. I mentor uh, as well several uh, young ladies. And as you were speaking, it occurred to me that it's interesting. People who, mm-hmm. you know, just know of me and don't know me well call me Dr. Mo. But these young ladies very quickly as we develop a relationship start mm-hmm. calling me auntie. And that is a thing with millennials now and, and older females. And I haven't seen that with, you know, the couple of previous generations between myself and my parents. And that is such a term, um, not only of endearment, but of respect that I'm yeah. not just going to call you by your name, but I'm going to call you auntie as well, back to that connectedness yeah. and, and relationship. And, and I, I really like it, you know, but uh, I can see it in a different light now that we've had this conversation. And no, I don't, I don't have a negative mm-hmm. impression of millennials as a group. And I don't think they all think, mm-hmm. you know, boomers are old and, and stodgy, but we tend to want to make those generalizations yeah. that disconnect us yeah. when we adopt those those negative attitudes about any group of people. And, and your students are very, very lucky to have you. I'm not surprised that you got that feedback just in my couple of conversations with you. Well, let's move to what you've done with your experience uh, with the students, with India, with with your leadership and organizational alignment. You have written a memoir, a very uh, well-reviewed, critically acclaimed memoir titled Lost and Found, Seeking the Past and Finding Myself. You have so many forums for expression. Why did you write a book, this book in particular? It's a beautiful story that I felt needed to be shared. And it's it's about this, what I've experienced is a lot of people are searching. And, but they're also not sure of how or the process or what should I be doing? So I wrote this book. As a, as a personal journey to support and help people with their journey. And it's been interesting because I've had many conversations and I've, I've been fortunate that I found the actual house. But I've also had people who have said, you know, for example, you know, I had a conversation with someone who said, you know, my ancestral roots are in Sicily, but you know what? You know, we don't know the house, the town, the village, the place. I just know they came from Sicily. And you know what, Sam, I'll never be able to find it. And my conversation to them was, but when you, have you been to Sicily? And they said, yeah, yeah, no, I went to Sicily. I said, but when you were there, did you feel connected to this place? And they said, well, yeah, absolutely. Because my ancestors came from there. I said, well, you've done the same thing that I've done. It's just a different lens, a different, uh, you know, maybe not as microscopic, but you felt this connection. Right. And they were like, oh, so embrace that sense and feeling of connectedness that you have with this place. And that's the that's really what motivated me was, you know, this idea of sharing about the search, but also of realizing one's own identity and embracing that identity as well. Uh, because in the book, what I describe is the fact that, you know, we are comprised of different cultural backgrounds, uh, identities even, when in fact we're actually a blend of different cultural identities and, you know, embrace those so that I can be Canadian, Indian, Fijian, and British. Uh, You know, it's a blend of, it's like watercolors. It's not uh, separate and distinct. Absolutely. that's that's so important for people to understand that you know we're really all multiracial and mm-hmm. in a culture that I mean in societies that are so accustomed to mm-hmm. you know narrowing ourselves down to one thing and and checking a little box that's supposed to comprehensively describe us 
Uh, what you're saying is, is a game changer. However, in the meantime, for those who really don't, because it's not something we taught, we're mm-hmm. taught if, for if, for those who really don't understand their cultural identity, mm-hmm. how do they explain themselves yeah. to others? The way for me, it, I mean, I, I guess I like food and for me, it, it embraces on, around food. And I think the best way I can describe it is the fact that uh, what my life was before going to India was what we call a tali. And a tali is a platter with segmented dishes, Canadian, Indian, Fijian, and British. So, and I mean, I played in an Irish military pipe band. So, hey, there's a bit of Irish chutney in there too. So it's all separated and segmented. But, you know, you when I'm at an you know, Fijian Indian event, you know, then that's my community and it's segmented. When I'm, you know, with my Canadian friends, you know, we're segmenting ourselves. When I went to India, a realization that I had, and it was an epiphany I had, like I woke up at 4 a.m. before going to uh, the Golden Temple in uh, Amritsar in India. And I just remember this epiphany. It was like, I'm, wait. I'm not a tali. I'm not a platter with segmented dishes that are separate and distinct. I'm kichuri, and kichuri is a rice dish where it's a blend of flavors and spices, but it all has this beautiful flavor to it. When you blend it, I guess the equivalent would be like making an omelet, and uh, you know you pull whatever is in your fridge and you just pull it together. Or it's stew. A, or <laughs> stew. Right. But it's the blend of those flavors. So I'm. I realize. After that, that, you know, when I'm in my company, you know, of friends that are Canadian, you know, we can share our different cultural backgrounds and embrace all of that. When I'm with my, you know, counterparts from from Britain, we sit there and we have curry together while we're in England and uh, we we embrace and, uh, you know, it's it's about that blend. And that's where I said, my life is not a tali. My life is kitchery. And people are like, Wow, I'm kitchery too. And it's I'm like and then, too. <laughs> yeah. so kitchery is this beautiful rice dish that's a staple basic diet in uh, Indian cuisine. And uh, you know, I think that that just sort of a, describes the way that I like to to say is that we're all kitchery. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you so much for this enlightenment. I've learned a lot, never had a conversation like this. I, I talked to a lot of interesting people. But this particular topic and conversation, fascinating as it is, is also very unique. And um, I look forward to you continuing your journey and documenting it for us to read and relish. Tell the listeners how they can connect with you, social media, website, and where they can purchase your book. Sure. One of the easiest ways is to go to my website, which is www.sam-thiara, T-H-I-A-R-A.com. And that's where I've got about 185 blog posts that people can just go and read about life experiences and ways that they can embrace some of the things to make their life extraordinary. My book is listed there as well, or you can go to Amazon. It's on there. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. So you can always find me there as well. All right. Very, very accessible. I love it. And I will drop all of those in the show notes and I'll be following you and connecting with you as well. Thank you so very much for being my guest today, Sam Thierra. Uh, Well, I appreciate it. And thank you so much. And I'm going to leave you with one of my favorite quotes that I live by. Everyone's life is an autobiography. Make yours worth reading. We're all living stories. We all have a need to share our stories. So go out there and live your autobiography. Wow. Live your autobiography, period. Thank you. And wasn't that a great program? Oh, love that episode. I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. Learn more about me on my website, drmoanderson.com. That's M-O-E. You can read book excerpts, watch videos, learn about my services that I offer, and book me for a speaking engagement. I'd love to talk with your group, and I'd love to work with you. So until the next time, review, renew, and re-you. Thank you.